Hello and welcome to another episode of Locked on Wolves. This is the postgame podcast. The Timberwolves are now 2-0 after defeating the New Orleans Pelicans in an ugly game on Saturday night, but the Wolves held on at the end. We're going to talk all things Wolves-Pelicans, including key takeaways from the game, the overall game flow, as well as individual studs and duds. Welcome into the show. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. I'm also the co-editor of Dunking with Wolves, the Timberwolves site on the fan side of network. Today's episode of Locked On Wolves is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Happy Saturday slash Sunday. Happy weekend, everybody, and happy Minnesota Timberwolves victory weekend. The Wolves defeated the New Orleans Pelicans on Saturday night. They're now 2-0. It was an ugly game, but today's show is going to be all about that game. We're going to do key takeaways from the game as well as uh, the overall game flow, how the Wolves hung on at the end, uh, despite Carl Anthony Towns following out, not even at the midway point of the fourth quarter, and then also individual studs and duds from this game. So that's the show here today. Um, first of all, thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first list each and every day, including on the weekend when the Wolves play. Remember, Lockdown Wolves is free and available on all platforms that includes YouTube as well as Apple, Google, Spotify, uh, the all-new Odyssey app, and uh, really anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can follow on Twitter at Lockdown T-Wolves and also at Beacon with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get into the game flow here quickly. The Pelicans, of course, were playing on the second night of a back-to-back, and we're already 0-2 on the year. They got beat by 20 by the Sixers on Wednesday, and then they were beat by, I think it was 12 or 14, by the Chicago Bulls on Friday night. And uh, so second night of a road back-to-back, no Zion Williamson, of course. Also no Josh Hart, who also missed Friday's game. I think it was a quadriceps issue. So down two starters, including, of course, their best player by far in Zion Williamson. Um, And uh, this was a game the Wolves should have won. Two days rest at home. um, Full strength. No excuse for the Wolves to lose this game. And it looked like they were going to win it fairly easily based on the beginning of of the contest. Uh, the Wolves dominated early in the game. They started the game up uh, 10 to nothing. Then the Pelicans, or excuse me, 8 to nothing. The Pelicans scored 10 straight themselves. So it was an 8-0 Wolves run, a 10-0 Pelicans run, and then a mini Wolves run that got them back on top. Carl Anthony Towns was phenomenal in the first quarter. He scored 13 points in the first. A couple of three-pointers, a couple of post touches, um, offensive rebounds, was doing a little bit of everything. And the Wolves had, a, a, after they gave up the lead and the Pelicans, I think led by as many as four in the first quarter. By the way, the Pelicans had led in their first two games of the season for a total of like 48 seconds uh, over the course of the season, according to the Valley sports North broadcast with, with Dave Benz and and Jim Peterson. Dave mentioned that early in the game. Um, And the wolves then built another double digit lead early in the first, but gave it all back late in the first quarter and ended up only with a one point lead headed to the second, they played much better in the second quarter. The bench started the the quarter really just a bench unit out on the floor. Eventually, Nas Reed was on the floor with only bench players, which I thought was interesting. And we'll talk more about the rotation later in the key takeaways. But it was starters plus Nas, which was something we saw similar. I guess it wasn't exactly the starters, but we saw Nas play a lot down the stretch after Towns eventually fell out. Um, but Nas played well with the starters. They went on a little like a 5-0, 6-0 run with Nas on the court with starters. Towns came back, had a close, a strong close to the first half uh, for the most part and ended up being up by 10 at halftime. So Wolves up by 10 at the half. And then in the third quarter, the Pelicans started to kind of chip away. The Wolves offense was really stagnant. They were stuck on like single it was single digits they had like nine points uh, with only a couple of minutes left in the third quarter in fact and we'll talk more about this in key takeaways but the wolves at the two minute mark two and a half minute mark of the third quarter so almost the end of the third quarter the wolves had only three free throw attempts on the entire night at that point they were one of three from the line nas had a couple of free throws right around that point in time but and for the game by the way the wolves were just six of ten at the line which is not a recipe for success uh, at all for anybody to only shoot 10 free throws over the course of the game. Um, and, uh, you know, the Wolves, it's not like they weren't being aggressive. There was no rhythm to the offense. And again, that's something else I want to dig into a little bit more. Uh, but they weren't getting the calls and they weren't really persevering despite that. They weren't really fighting through the contact, truly getting to the rim. And they weren't sh- shooting the ball well enough from the outside to to manage a win either. 
Um, so it, it just was was pretty ugly. They're also out rebounded in the third quarter by 20, uh, excuse me, by a margin of 20 to nine. Timberwolves pulled down nine rebounds total in the third quarter. Um, and then at the end of the third quarter, the Wolves got a steal, had a three on one fast break, uh, ended up getting a shot block. The ball was going out of bounds. Um, and I think it was Jared Vanderbilt saved it and got it right into Nas Reed, who just kind of caught it in traffic and flipped it in right at the buzzer. And that play, I typed this in my notes at that moment, was basically a microcosm of the game where the Wolves did the right thing on defense. They got on a fast break. It was a terrible fast break. They made the hustle play to save the ball from going out of bounds. It happened to go right to Nas Reed. I, I mean, Vando tried to pass it to Nas, but he got it to Nas and he flipped it in right at the buzzer. So ultimately, the right thing happened. It started the right way, right? The process was all messed up in the middle, and then it finished in, in a positive way for the Timberwolves. That was a microcosm of the game, and that was before we even got to the fourth quarter. Um, the Wolves opened the fourth with Jordan McLaughlin, Malik Beasley, Anthony Edwards, Torian Prince, and Carl Anthony Towns on the floor. And uh, Malik Beasley was great in transition. He was really quiet in the first half and only played 19 minutes. And I, that appears to be a par for the course. Uh, well, I mean, we're two games in, but that seems like the early season plan is Beasley's not going to get a ton of run, not what he did last year, but he played really well in the fourth quarter in this game and, and helped them early in the fourth kind of maintain their lead. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about depth later, but Torian Prince guarded uh, guarded Brandon Ingram for a good chunk of time in the fourth quarter and did a really good job. It, just a luxury to be able to have Prince come off the bench and, and be able to do a solid job on a, on an all-star like Brandon Ingram towns fouled out of this game with six, uh, six forty three remaining, I believe is what it was. Um, let me pull up, pull up my note here. I think it was six forty three. Uh, yeah, six forty three mark. The wolves are up nine at the time. Um, and towns fouls out on it. First, there's a double fall, double foul on a rebound on the other end of the floor. I, I hate the double foul call. I get it though. Towns was kind of pulling down Valentinus. Valentinus was, all was not bothered by falling on top of towns. He, he had a hand in that as well. Then on the other end towns spins baseline and elbows Valanciunas in the head. He did do that. I understand why it's an offensive foul. I, I just, you know, it, it, that type of it. And, and actually after the game, Chris Finch talked about this in the post game that towns gets called for more offensive fouls. And it seems like any other star player. Yes, that was a foul, but how many times are we seeing guys do that? How many times did Shaq do that throughout his career and not get called for a foul? Um, how many times do we see Joel and B do that and not get called for a foul? But anyway, it's called called on towns. He then gets a technical for leaving the court on his way to the bench, kind of going down the tunnel and around to the bench. Um, and he's out of the game. He gets called for attack. And there's 643 left. I mean, he got the fifth and sixth fouls in such rapid succession, and the Wolves were still kind of clinging to that nine-point lead, trying to build it back up. So Finch hadn't pulled him from the game yet, and he's gone for the rest of the game. As it turns out, they ultimately win by seven, and it should have been nine, except for a silly foul at the end of the game. Um, but, it, you know, it was a little dicey late. Uh, D'Angelo Russell had to hit a big three. Um, they were, uh, let's see, it was uh, there was 239 left. The Wolves were up only three. D'Lo makes a three-pointer to push it to six. Then it's back down to four with about 30 seconds left. D'Angelo Russell banks in a difficult three in an ISO situation with 25.9 left on the clock to basically win the game, put the Wolves up seven with 25 seconds left. It was a crazy shot. Um, and uh, D'Lo had a terrible game. We'll talk more about that later, but hit two big threes and a couple of other big shots in the fourth quarter, did all of his damage late. Um, and Anthony Edwards had a really quiet fourth quarter. Uh, he didn't do much at all down the stretch. And that was the time I tweeted this at, when Towns went out. This was the time when we need to see if Anthony Edwards can take over with no Carl Anthony Towns on the floor to take some of the heat off of him. And Edwards had a couple of kind of so-so possessions. He made a couple of nice passes where the Wolves missed open threes that would have given him assists. And overall, Ant played well. But this was the D'Angelo Russell show down the stretch. Nobody else really did much, and the Wolves' offense continued to just look really sluggish late in the game. But the Wolves held on. They ended up winning by seven. And uh, it was uh, it was a slug... Uh, I don't know. Slugfest is the, we'll call it a slog fest uh, in that this was, I mean, what was the final 96 to 89? Um, so not exactly, uh, you know, they're not going to send the tape of this one to the Naismith Hall of Fame, are they? Um, but at fun, fun first quarter, fun finish to the game with Dilo hitting the big shots and awesome that the Wolves are able to hold on, basically hold serve entirely uh, with no Carl Anthony Towns in the game in the final six plus minutes of the game. All right. I want to hit key takeaways next. A couple things I haven't talked about yet. So we're going to do all that here coming up 
Uh, first, though, let's talk about our title sponsors of the show today, and that, of course, is McDonald's. This episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's a place where friends and family can come to reconnect, a place where classmates can, classmates can meet up for a study group, knowing they'll have dependable Wi-Fi and endless supplies of French fries and McFlurries. Win or lose, it's a place where teammates, competitors, the home team, or the away team can come to recharge, and it's the place you always look forward to stopping at on a long road trip to rest your legs and refuel. McDonald's is a staple of every road trip for my family. Also, just last night, I had some McDonald's. My wife was coming home from an event, and it was like, hey, we're still hungry. Let's grab some McDoubles and some fries. Fantastic. Late night, early morning, McDonald's breakfast is the best. Um, I mean, what are you waiting for? Head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Did somebody say Lockdown Wolves McDonald's watch party? ba da ba 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 I'm loving it. McDonald's. All right, uh, let's go ahead and talk about um, and talk about key takeaways from this one. Um, okay, so the Timberwolves. I mean, generally speaking, this was this was a uh, like I said a minute ago, a slug fest, right? The entire game, save for the first quarter, which is a little bit more up and down, a little bit more fun. Uh, but the offense for the Wolves, uh, I mean, there's no other way to say it. It was really ugly. Um, Again, save for the first, most of the first quarter. It was bad in the half court. They never really got into a rhythm. And, and I said this after the game on, on Wednesday, the win over the Rockets. It was kind of the same thing. Uh, the, the half court offense was really slow early in the Rockets game until they started to get to the free throw line. Then there was a bit more of a rhythm established. Everything opened up and they started making threes late in the game. This game was flipped. They started the game by making a bunch of threes. They never really established uh, the ability to, to dump. Well, I shouldn't say that. They did kind of dominate in the paint early, but that was more just towns you know, on the glass. They rebounded the ball so well, but they weren't getting to the free throw line. Um, and then when the threes stopped falling, the offense was just completely disjointed uh, later in the game. But the problems weren't simply in the half court. It also extended to the fast break. Um, the spacing in the open floor was horrible for the Wolves in this game. There were... I mean, I could go back and rewatch this, and I bet there's six to eight times minimum that the Wolves had bad floor spacing in a transition situation in like a three on two or a four on three, or whatever it might be. And it just, and even like a four on one, there's one example. I think it was the play in the fourth quarter where Beasley got fouled in the, in, a, in the open floor. It was a McLaughlin steal. It was Beasley Edwards. And I forget who else was running on the other wing and uh, McLaughlin kicked it back to Beasley. He was the closest player, but the spacing was poor. The defender was closer to Beasley. And if he'd gone a little further back to Edwards, it would have been a dunk, maybe an and one Instead, Beasley gets fouled. He misses both free throws and the wolves get nothing off of a great defensive play from McLaughlin and a four and one fast break. They get zero points um, and credit the Pelicans for playing that correctly. I don't remember who the defender was for new Orleans, um, but that was an example of poor spacing, the wrong decision by McLaughlin Beasley, not able to make the shot when he was fouled or make the free throws. Um, and that's just one example that's front of mind, but there were at least five, six, seven others just like that, where the spacing was bad. The decision-making was generally poor and the execution overall in the fast in fast in the open floor situation was, was just miserable. Um, now all that to say the offense will be just fine. Don't, don't worry about the Timberwolves offense. Don't worry about scoring 96 against a, a depleted and already kind of a poor Pelicans team, which by the way, with no Zion Williamson and, Compound that by no Josh Hart. And I, I ripped on them enough in yesterday's show or uh, yeah, well, in Friday's show uh, uh, for their off season because their, their roster is not great. Um, this is going to be a struggle for them if Zion remains out for much longer. Um, and, and then compounding that with other missing starters is, is not good. But um, the Wolves offense will be okay. They've got too much talent on offense to not be okay. I mean, it was fine on Wednesday, right? I mean, they started a little slow. But it was fine. I mean, and, and granted, there were only three guys in double figures, but D'Angelo Russell, Carl Anthony Towns, and, and Anthony Edwards are going to get theirs. And eventually, Malik Beasley, some of these other guys are going to come to the party. You know, Prince was very good from downtown in the Wednesday game. Um, it just the Wolves offense never got into enough of a flow to get to get their true three point shooters open three point attempts. I guess Beverly struggled a little from outside the arc in this one. But um, all that to say. The offense was miserable. Like both things can be true, right? The Wolves offense was really bad, both in the open floor and in the half court, but it will be fine long-term. I think both can be true. It's a rhythm thing. The free throw attempts, again, three free throw attempts for the Wolves near the end of the third quarter. And then for the game total, they only had 10 free throw attempts. Um, and a couple of those late in the game when the Pelicans intentionally fouled. So effectively they had eight up until, up until the Pels tried to follow the Wolves late in the game 
to uh, to extend the game. Uh, just a miserable performance in terms of half court offense and, and fast break offense from the Wolves. Um, point number two or takeaway number two: the rotation remains really intriguing. Um, and I'm going to make two points here, actually. So th these are two separate takeaways. One, the rotation is intriguing. And two, the depth of this team really came through. So I'll get to the depth in a second. They're related, but but they're two separate points. Trust me. So rotation being intriguing. Um, I made a note sometime in the third quarter that basically Jordan McLaughlin is now out of the rotation, right? Beverly was suspended for the Wednesday game because of the playoff stuff from last year. So he didn't play. McLaughlin assumed the backup point guard minutes on Wednesday. With Beverly back on Saturday, McLaughlin didn't play at all in the first three quarters. So I made the note sometime middle of the game that, Hey, McLaughlin's the odd man out. It's kind of what I would have expected, but D'Lo was having a bad game. And I don't know if this is because of D'Lo having a bad game, or if this is something back when McLaughlin resigned, I talked about on this show about the possibility that McLaughlin's still in the rotation and the wolves just kind of use him to spell Russell and Beverly and then bring one or both of them back in crunch time. Well, McLaughlin. So I don't know if this was because D'Lo was struggling or because this was the plan all along. But McLaughlin started the fourth quarter on the floor by himself. Uh, well, not by himself, but as the only point guard. No Beverly, no Russell on the floor. And finished the game with D'Lo. And Patrick Beverly did not play a single minute in the fourth quarter. He played 22 minutes over the first three quarters. So 22 of the first 36 minutes of this game did not see the floor in the fourth quarter. Jordan McLaughlin was the flip, flip side. He didn't see the floor at all in the first three quarters. Played all 12 minutes, every single second of the fourth quarter in this game. And it was fantastic. McLaughlin was. Um, and uh, so that to me was really notable. Also, Josh Akogi didn't play a minute in the fourth. And the Wolves had the luxury of Torian Prince. We'll talk about him in a minute. Um, being able to be on the court. And when Jaden McDaniels was getting a getting a breather at the beginning of the fourth quarter. But Akogi uh, was the only Wolves player who didn't score, by the way. He was fine in the first half. He actually was really good defensively. He moved the ball well on offense. He had a couple of really nice passes. He had a couple of steals in the first half. Um, only played 18 minutes, which actually ended up being the second least on the team next to McLaughlin, who, again, only played the fourth quarter. Uh, so the rotation is really intriguing, and I'm fascinated to see how this plays out. Now, if Chris Finch is to be believed, and I don't see why he wouldn't be based on his comments in the media, this rotation may not like be super settled. There's basically going to be 11 guys that are going to see minutes, which is what we saw in this game. There were 11 guys who played, and all of them played 12 or more minutes. Um, and it may not be the same thing every night, right? I mean, of the four guys who didn't play, Nathan Knight, uh, who were active, right? So Knight was active. Mc McKinley Wright wasn't of the two-way guys. Nathan Knight, Jake Lehman, Jalen Noel, Leandro Balmaro. I None of those guys are going to be regular rotation guys early in the season if everybody's healthy, right? There's no expectation that they will be. So are all 11 of these players going to see time? Now, this was obviously impacted a little by the town's fall trouble, but really, I guess that only gave Nas the minutes increase in the fourth. Um, but I think this is going to be really fun to watch and, and see how this rotation continues to, to evolve over the next few, uh, few games. Uh, my third takeaway is the depth of this team. Once again, there's 11 guys that played it. And Beverly said this post game uh, in his interview on Valley Sports North with Marty Gilner that there's 10, 11 guys, you know, a good chunk of whom, 10, 11 rotation worthy guys, a good chunk of whom are starter worthy guys. That's, and that's where the wolves are at. I talked about preseason. I didn't think a Kogi would be a starter on this team. Um, and he is a starter simply because of the skill set that he possesses that augments the other, you know, the offensive minded players with Beasley coming off the bench. I get that. But, um, I mean, you could make an argument for starting every single guy that played except for maybe McLaughlin and Reed simply because the wolves depth at those, at their positions at point guard and at center. Um, but I mean, there's like, eight or nine guys that you can make an argument for as starters on a good team and the depth of this team. And what stuck out, stuck out to me the most was Torian Prince in the fourth quarter coming in, hadn't played a whole, a whole lot middle stages of the game. He came in early in the first quarter. Like he, it seems like he will kind of as a sixth, seventh guy, and then came in at the start of the fourth and really locked down Brandon Ingram um, and, and bridged the gap to when Jaden McDaniels came back late in the game. And McDaniels was able to do a solid job on Ingram late. And yeah, Ingram got 30 and he, shot the ball over 50% from the field, but he had seven turnovers and, and they forced him to pass the ball and, and be an assist guy in the fourth quarter, probably more than the Pelicans needed him or wanted him to be. Uh, so I thought Prince being able to give the wolves an option, a secondary option on Brandon Ingram was really important. And he did an outstanding job, but that just goes to, to underscore the depth that this team really does possess. Okay. Let's finish with individual studs and duds, which by the way, was a little bit more challenging than I was expecting. Uh, in this one. Um, but we'll do that here next. First though, let's talk about our friends over at built bar. Built bar is the best tasting protein bar of all time. You have my word on that. It tastes exactly like a candy bar. If you're not a built bar person 
or excuse me, if you're not a protein bar person, you should be, and you should be a built bar person. Because again, I, I didn't like protein bars ever. I never really ate them. The ones I tried didn't taste good, but then I tried built bar and it's phenomenal. I have one every single day, sometimes two. Um, and again, they taste exactly like a candy bar. They're always releasing new flavors on the website, limited edition flavors. Um, you know, just, just, a. a uh, amazing mix of new flavors all the time. There's some new fall flavors out now. There's nine nine staple flavors though. You can get a mixed box right now. You get two of each of the nine flavors, um, and that's probably the way to go if you've never tried them before. But look out for the mint brownie, the cookies and cream, anything with coconut. They're all delicious. And check out the macros in Built Bar: 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from only 130 per bar, which is crazy, to 180. Because again, these taste like candy bars. You'll get uh, four or five grams of sugar and just four to five grams net carbs in each bar. Built Bar is also the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. Go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. Okay, let's get into individual studs and duds from this one. This was actually a little bit of a challenge. Um if you'd asked me at halftime or even sometime in the third quarter, the first two studs would have been super easy, and I'm still going to stick with them. Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards were both fantastic in the first first half of this game. Cat had 13 in the first quarter alone, um, and was really good. He held jo uh, Jonas Valanciunas down for most of the game, battled him really well, had a couple of just killer box outs. There was one in the third quarter. I made a note about it. He he faced up Valanciunas on the on the boards and boxed him out, allowed Akogi to get a tough rebound, and the Wolves scored on a fast break going the other way. Really great game overall from Towns. And again, the first half was fantastic. He got sucked in a little bit with the foul game, as he tends to do, and, and I noted in the preseason on this show and also after the first game of the season that Towns did a good job avoiding that. Uh, he ran into it again in this one. He had, I think, two, maybe three offensive fouls of course he fouled out at the 643 mark of the fourth quarter so he had five turnovers but two or three of those were because of offensive fouls directly one was a miscommunication um so it would have been really easy to trim those five turnovers back to one or two but the other numbers are all fantastic 25 points 10 of 20 shooting three of six outside the arc he did only attempt the two free throws made both of them he also only had four rebounds in just 29 minutes but he had three blocks and two assists in this one as well uh, just a good all around game from towns. The foul thing is not great, but he was the reason the wolves built the lead that they had in the first place. Um, and he's just got to continue to work on body control. Jim Peterson talks about this all the time on the wolves broadcast. Um, knowing what his off arm is doing at all times is super important. Knowing what his shoulders are doing when he steps through. Uh, it is true that I think he's officiated differently for whatever reason. I don't know if there's some sort of narrative that's out there that uh, that officials are subscribing to, but you know, a good chunk of the time they are fouls. It's just frustrating that it's not consistently called on other players in the league. Uh, but anyways, cats a stud for the, for this one. I'm still going to give one to Anthony Edwards, despite the fact he all but disappeared in the fourth quarter. I think he had 16 at halftime. If I'm not mistaken, he ended this game with only 19 points and eight of 22 shooting. But he was three of eight outside the arc, which is good. He had nine rebounds, five assists, a steal and a block, and only one turnover. He was a team best plus 10 in the plus minus column, which I will uh, mention plus minus if I think it's relative, re relevant. But if you're a regular listener to the show, you know that it. I I like to note that it's very noisy and there's a lot that goes into it. Obviously, it's not the end-all be-all. I'm by no means suggesting he was the best player on the floor in this game, although plus minus would suggest that. He had the best plus minus mark in the game of any individual player. Um, he also by far played the most minutes on the Wolves. He played 37 minutes. Nobody else played more than 29 um, for the Wolves. But 19 points, nine rebounds, five assists, a steal and a block for Ant, only one turnover in 37 minutes. And I thought he was really, really good for about two and a half quarters. Would have been great to see him step up a bit more in the fourth, but we can't discount what he did in the first part of the game, just like Towns, allowing the Wolves to build that lead. Now, my third stud, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. I'm going to cheat a little bit. And I'm going to combine Jordan McLaughlin and Torian Prince and give them each half of half of the third stud for this one, um, because Jordan McLaughlin didn't play the whole game, played every single second of the fourth quarter and was great. Six points, two rebounds, two steals and assist, two of three shooting and uh, got to the free throw line and made both of his free throws there. Uh, really, really good for Jordan McLaughlin, the defense, the energy, the hustle plays. He had two steals, but there were two or three other loose balls. He got his hands on um, contesting rebounds and was just all over the floor. Now he had a ton of, um, you know, he, 
hadn't played all game, right? So he had fresh legs coming to the fourth quarter. That helps. But that's also just the way that J-Mac always plays is he plays um, with, uh, with I would even call it reckless abandon. He's It's an under control hustle, which like say Jared Vanderbilt is not always under control, but he plays hard. Jordan McLaughlin's pretty much always under control and he pretty much always plays hard. He's just a solid player. And he had a great fourth quarter, very good defensively, aggressive. Um, ball pressure was fantastic for him. And it's always been good, but it feels like it's up a half notch after being around Patrick Beverly. Um, the other half stud goes to Torian Prince because I thought he did a great job on Brandon Ingram in the fourth quarter. Kind of a, an unsung hero in this one. Only 16 minutes played, only three points, one of three shooting. He made a three early in the game, uh, had one rebound, one assist, one steal in 16 minutes. But the defense was really, really good down the stretch. And so I'm going to split it between Prince and McLaughlin. But this is also the part of the show where I'm going to call out some other stuff I liked. And that was uh, Malik Beasley's fourth quarter. I mentioned this in the game flow, but he did uh, six points, three of five uh, shooting from the floor, um, missed those free throws late. But, uh, you know, besides that was really, really good um, overall for the game. And um, man, I just man, this box score, I'm looking at the ESPN box score and there's some they had some mistakes in here. This was the same early in the game. They had um, they had Malik Beasley or excuse me. They had Towns with five personals when he'd fouled out. And for some reason, it's got Prince as 0-2 at the free throw line, but I'm almost positive that was Malik Beasley that missed those two free throws in transition late in the game. I'm almost 100% sure that, that, was, that was, those were Beasley's missed free throws. But uh, at any rate, still a solid fourth quarter from Beasley despite the missed free throws. And then uh, Jared Vanderbilt only played 13 minutes, but he had eight rebounds and three steals in 13 minutes, which is nuts. Um, look at basketball reference on Sunday and, and take a look at his block and steal rates. Um, or steal and rebound rates, I should say, they're going to be off the charts. Uh, another good game from Vando, and I would expect him to see more minutes moving forward. This was just a really interesting game um, with the way things kind of shook out and also the lineup that the Pelicans play. Um, okay, duds. It was actually really hard to come up with a dud for this game too because up until the end of the game, D'Angelo Russell was hands down the worst player on the floor for the Wolves. Um, and I'm still going to I'm going to cheat a little on this one too. It's only the second game of the season. I'm already fudging the rules on my studs and duds game here. But we're going to say non-fourth quarter D'Angelo Russell is is the is the dud for this game. He was terrible before the fourth quarter. He was like one of nine shooting. He had six turnovers before the fourth quarter. Uh, no assists going into the fourth. Excuse me, one assist. He finished the game with 12 points, three rebounds, one assist, seven turnovers, two of seven outside the arc, five of 14 shooting and zero free throw attempts. Um, but he hit the two biggest shots of the game for the Wolves, two three pointers in the fourth quarter was really obviously vital to the Wolves winning this game to the Wolves, keeping that lead with Edwards going quiet and, and towns on the bench with six fouls. Um, and then also, I guess. I guess if we're not going to debate the Wolves three point shooting, I have to call that out as being awful in this game, 12 of 38, 31.6%, which I guess isn't awful, awful, but it's not good. Um, biggest culprits, Patrick Beverly, one of five, Russell, two of seven, uh, McDaniels, O of two and Nas Reed, uh, two of six, I guess isn't awful, but, um, Nas was two of six outside the arc with a bunch of those deep top of the key three point attempts that Nas likes to take. Um, so three point shooting, getting to the free throw line, Fast break offense, half court offense. Offensively, this was bad for the Wolves. Somehow shooting a sub 32% from three and only attempting 10 free throws and Towns falling out with six plus minutes left in the game. They scored 96 points, which if you told me all that stuff, I'd be like, oh, they probably struggled to score 80 and lost this game. They won in part because the opponent was depleted and not very good. And also because they hit a couple of big shots down the stretch. And, and also they had built, they had done so well early in the game. Um, mostly Towns and Edwards in terms of, of their offense. But uh, at any rate, the, the cliff notes on this one, ugly, sloppy, terrible offense, active defense, enough, uh, enough good defense and rebounding early in the game. By the way, they were minus 15 on the glass too for the game. The Wolves were, but they were really good early and they built that 10 point lead at halftime. They ended up winning by seven. Um, so I guess we could call it gritty as much as I think that that gets thrown around a bit too much. This was a gritty victory. And I said this on Twitter, but if this is the worst the Wolves play offensively all year, and it has to be about as bad as they're ever going to play offensively. Um, great. That's great news. They still won the game against admittedly a bad opponent, but you still have to beat. I mean, this Pelicans team could very easily come in and win on Monday for their first win of the season. You still have to play the teams that are in front of you, whether they're healthy or injured. And uh, the Wolves, gutted out a win when their offense was awful. And that's really, that's really good. Um, early in the season, most teams offenses are not clicking. The wolves are in that boat, um, even though they scored a bunch of points on Wednesday, but um, riding the defense and the hustle and the rebounding and all that stuff 
uh, to a win early in the season is great. And hopefully the offense clicks a lot better on Monday. I'm sure the Wolves will have plenty to talk about in the film room on Sunday, preparing for Monday's game um, because the offense again was, was not on par with uh, where it needs to be. Okay. That's all we have for you today here on the show. We'll of course be back on Monday with the regular Monday podcast. If you're new to the show, this is a Monday through Friday uh, daily podcast with post game podcasts after weekend games as well. Post game pods every night of the week. We'll post immediately following the game. So, We'll have a Monday morning show and then Monday night following the game, we'll do a post game pod that posts late Monday into early Tuesday, and that'll count as Tuesday's show. Um, so be sure that you're following or subscribe to the show if you're not already. And uh, you can do that again anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. Free and available on all platforms. That includes YouTube. If you don't want to have to look at my face while you listen to the show, you can also just listen to the audio anywhere you get podcasts, Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, the all new Odyssey app. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves. And my account at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Reminder that Locked On Wolves is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Remember, the Locked On Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves Podcast, and we'll catch you next time.